Song said that mansion is at the end of life's troubles and way. Well, we live in a time of trouble, but if you go back over history, you'll find there's been a few times that there has been trouble of one degree or the other, to one extent or the other. I want to deal with the subject this morning that is before our eyes all the time, especially these days, but it's been in the national life for a long time. Is racism sinful? Are you a racist? Now, if you were to ask me that, the first thing I would say is, is, what do you mean by racism? And what do you mean by racist? Now, those who've heard me preach and teach and debate know how much I believe in defining terms because there can't be any communication, proper communication, unless we're all defining our terms and our conversation in the same way. If you give a meaning to a word that's different from the meaning I use, then there can't be a proper discussion. There can only be what's called in logic a verbal dispute. So we have to define our terms. So before any one of us can truthfully begin to answer this question, then we must say, what is racism? What is to be a racist? And before the sermon, is finished, we shall see that different people have different ideas, radically different ideas about the meaning of racism or racist, that is what it means to be one. So I would like to begin by simply defining racism. I go to Webster's Dictionary, you can go to any good dictionary, you get about the same thing. And racism is defined as, and I'm quoting, <coughs> the belief in the superiority or dominance of one race over another. Let me read it again. The belief in the superiority or dominance of one race over another. Now, of course, as Colossians 3.17 says, it's on the wall above my head, whatever we do as children of God, members of the church, as Christians, which means, as you know, a Christian is one who is of Christ. We want to have the Lord's will governing us regardless of what anybody else does. So we're interested in what the Bible says, for all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. But when you're going to begin to talk to people, then as I said, and I'll emphasize, you must be on the same level of understanding of the meaning of a word. Now, we know that just among people talking about baptism. If I say to a person in the Methodist church, have you been baptized? Most of them will say yes. But if they baptize according to Methodist doctrine, they've never been immersed in water. They've never been buried in water. So Peter said, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. So I have to know then from the Bible that baptism of the Great Commission, of the gospel of Christ, the power of God to save us from sin, Romans 1.16, is a burial in water, an immersion in water. There's other things to it, but as far as the mode, then that's what the Bible says. If you don't like what the Bible says, I don't know what to tell you to about it. Why well, claim God, Christ, or the Bible as the infallible Word of God if you're going to change it every time it doesn't suit you? But people are known to do that. The Old Testament king read some part he didn't like to spit him out, just cut it out, threw it away. Didn't change God's mind on the matter. But some people think that way. When Eve was named by Adam, she was named so. That is called Eve. 
because she was the mother of all living. Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. Eve is your however many greats it would be. Grandmother. She's the first one. Now I was thinking about what Eric preached on here a while back when he talked about deoxyribose nucleic acid known as DNA. Got into the matter of genetics. And when you think about Adam and Eve, all of the genetic code that would impact any human being on this earth from that time until the end of time was in Adam and Eve's DNA. Now the Bible teaches that there are many ethnicities. Sometimes words are used differently. They'll say nations. Well, there's a difference in the nation that it's used to mean ethnicities. So we have to understand that part because nation can also mean a nationality. If you ask what the ethnicity is of an American, you're a mess because it's everything. Now you talk about the nationality of those who are citizens of the United States, then that's another story. But uh, there are some places that uh, ethnicity defines the people who make up that nation, but not always, and America is one of those. But in Genesis 3.20, she was the mother of all living. The all is significant, highly significant. You've heard me, those who hear me preach regularly, say, don't run over little words in the Bible. God, you don't need to be there because he teach me something. And when it says he's the, she's the mother of all living, that's all. You can't get more all than all. And she's the mother of all living. It means that every man and woman can trace their ancestry back to Adam and Eve. That's why Paul, the apostle of Christ, preaching a sermon in Athens of Greece long ago, Mars Hill, could say to the Athenians that he has made from one blood every nation of people to dwell in all the places of the earth, Acts 17, 26. By the way, that's one of the proofs that the uh, Bible is from God because at the time Paul said that, people didn't know that. People didn't know that everybody Every human had the same kind of blood. Now, types and so forth are story, what your blood type is. But nevertheless, all humans are created by God. And procreatively, from Adam and Eve on down, we are what we are. While many of their children sinned against God, that is Adam and Eve's children, one man down through the ages or down through the years, one man, Noah, remained faithful to God. And uh, when God destroyed the world, Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their three wives were saved from that flood to preserve the human race. Mark that down. To preserve humanity. And the only divisions there are in humanity is male and female. Now that's how the significant you get that in your mind. The cause of current events. Humanity is divided up only into two categories. Only into two categories. Male and female. So every person in this world can trace their lineage back to Noah and to one of his three sons. And that, of course, is the way you trace back to Adam and Eve. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark of Shem and Ham, and Japheth, Ham was father of Canaan. These were the three sons of Noah. In Genesis 9, verses 18 and 19, which I'm referring to here, says that these populate the whole earth. After the flood, mankind violated God's command to build the earth, multiply, replenish it. Now, one thing must be understood. If you know your Bible, you know this. There was but one language over the, all the earth and all humans spoke it. And at this time, they didn't want to spread out. They wanted to stick together. And so they attempted to settle in one area. And like men do, they began to start a building project. And they had an intention to make a, a name for themselves. 
which also indicates that pretty well put God out of their mind. As Romans chapter 1 says about the Gentiles, they did not retain God in their knowledge. That might have been a way they had even of uh, keeping people in one place. But be that as may, that's what they did. In Genesis chapter 11 in verse 4, they said, you know, let's come build, let's build a city, ourselves a city. And we'll build a tower. And the top will reach to heaven. Notice, we'll make a name for ourselves. A man forever has tried to do that. Make a name for ourselves. And they tell us why. Lest uh, they would be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. That's what God told you to do. You're trying to work counter to what God expects you to do. And that just doesn't work in the long run, sometimes in the short run, with God. Well, God, of course, then stopped the whole project. He did it in a very simple way. He just made it where they could communicate with one another. He made all these different languages. I don't know whether it was exactly on the family level or what, what it was, but languages, whatever they were, changed among the people, and they could not understand one another. That's the reason you've got to find your tongue. That's the reason that you have to go study another language. If you're going to speak to the Germans in German, you've got to study German. Well, they're speaking. So it is throughout the world. And we see that in America, especially now, it comes to Spanish. That's why we have our Spanish brethren meeting in this building, too. So that those who don't speak English, they all spoke English, they could be in here. Or if we all spoke Spanish, we could be with them, whichever way it goes. Of course, if you're bilingual, it wouldn't make a difference. Speak both languages. But you can see how understanding in language pulls you together. Not understanding the language separates you. Not do that. So there was communication made impossible. <coughs> so the people linked together according to their ability to understand one another. Genesis chapter 10 records the various ethnic groups or nations, as it's also called that resulted from this dispersion. People banding together, speaking the same language, so that's the way that they united. So the thing turns. If you go to England, they speak English, we speak English. They don't think we speak English. But anyway, we speak English enough to communicate, but there's a lot of terms that we even, in speaking English, do not use in the same way don't mean the same thing. If I were to tell you at night to hand me a torch so I could see, you would, only, you would think to hand me a, we say a flashlight, but that's what they mean. So you got to understand those things. If you tell somebody in Australia you're under the weather, especially if you're at church, they're going to look at you askance because being under the weather in Australia means you're drunk. So you've got to understand those things. And you have to tell people who are Americans going into all the world, because they think so many times that if you yell loud enough in English, they're going to understand you. That uh, you have to understand how they see things. People don't like to understand how other people see things. They just don't. Everybody knows you will see things like I do. Now, I'm not talking about truth and salvation. I'm just talking about ordinary operations and accommodating things. When we go into Southeast Asia and Islamic countries, uh, as I, I always did, I just forgot I had a left hand, and I kept it stuck in my pocket. Because we used both hands to think anything about it, but the Islamic people in that culture, even they're not Islamic, they think, because it's part of their culture, the left hand is, not, is uh, the dirty hand. So let's put it that way. And so on like that throughout the world. And that's why Paul said, I became all things to all men, that I might win some. Well, you know he didn't mean change the gospel. So, amen, I respect other people's thoughts and viewpoints just like I expect them to like mine. Sometimes we're not good at that. People sometimes wonder how we can gain such a diverse set of looks from one set of parents. I'm talking about physical looks. Well, the answer is found in genetics. It's that simple. Our genes are made up of pairs. The 
The simple explanation is that Adam and Eve would have had a blend of every possible hair on the earth. I think you a good job of telling us how long that genetic structure is, that DNA, it's, uh, however you describe it is. Scientific terms, they would have been heterozygous. And from them, they would have had children of a wide variety of colors and characteristics. Now, you know, I ask right here, what color is that? I have no idea. I have no idea what sort of, maybe they were born. What was the hair like? I don't know. You know, I never did get concerned about that. Once I understood especially, got old and understand genetics, I did. I first came across genetics studying agriculture, and which we studied for a while. And uh, you study about fruit flies because they can reproduce so much you can get a lot of them in a short time and see the genetic changes between them as you cross them. <coughs> but you can uh, set up pretty well and figure out where your herd, and they're teaching cattle your bulls half the herd. So then you can have uh, a black cow, and you can have a black bull or whatever. You can learn which genes are dominant, which are recessive. And so that's how people develop all these different little dogs that run around and yap, yap. And if things are left to normal, they disappear because the big dogs eat them. Something would. But man's done all of that. It's all been because they understood how genetics works, at least to a degree. And as families became isolated due to the language barrier, certain characteristics be became dominant in each family. I remember studying in sociology one time. <clears throat> they talked about, and I might have told you this before, that they could tell where certain French people came from in the given area of France. Because at one time in pagan days, big earlobes were considered to be a very beautiful thing. And if you came across a Frenchman consistently with big earlobes, they could pretty well trace you back to that area of France. But there was another part of France when tribes were in France, or called as it once was known, and kind of like Indian tribes were over here, there was another tribe that didn't like their big earlobes. Being pagan, sometimes they killed everybody that had big earlobes. Well, the little earlobe showed, so they could tell the Frenchman today pretty much what part of France his people came from, the size of the earlobe. And that's just an easy thing to say, but that's done all the time. It's done in animals and so forth. Today, then, we label these variations as races of men. There's but one human race, but as races of men. In reality, they are characteristics caused simply by regional inbreeding. That's if you want to put it bluntly. That's exactly what it is. Different ethnicities. So whatever color skin Adam and Eve had in their DNA was the genetic possibilities extant today or whatever may develop in the future. I have in my files something that was put out over 20 years ago because people who study the population of the United States knew about all this stuff that was happening, the influx of people, and they were showing here like 100 years from now the general overall color of the people in this country because of the belief. It's all genetics. So we must keep that particular matter in mind as we go through these things. When you consider Jesus, what did he look like? Well, I'm not talking about a, you're looking at a picture of somebody and then you're explaining to me what that person looked like. I'm talking about genetically. All I can say is, is that according to his DNA, he would have looked like the average Israelite. I know enough from prophecy that says he wasn't a glamorous person, he wasn't a handsome man, and you wouldn't look upon him and, and desire him. So he was whatever a Jew was as far as his physical body is concerned. But it really does matter what the skin color is of any of us, does it? It does not matter what the skin color is of any of our ancestors. Because to God, we are all one. In the New Testament, in the preaching of the gospel, as the gospel spread, as it went from the Jews to the Samaritans, and then to the Gentiles, 
Peter made this statement. But in every nation, he that feareth God and works righteousness is accepted by him. <clears throat> I've long said that if we practice the golden rule, do unto others you have to do unto you, you would solve every race problem and a whole lot of other problems. Do unto others you would have to do unto you. If you would follow the teaching of the parable of Good Samaritan in loving your neighbor, who's my neighbor? He's not in need. And what love is helping that person in need? That would settle all sorts of things. Just those two things. Then if we would love our brethren, members of the church, then we all would have no problem with one of those things. Yet, as the New Testament was being revealed, one of the biggest problems in the church was the Jew who became a Christian and had a Pharisaical background, according to Acts 15, wanted to make the Gentiles. And then do the color. Just a non-Jew. When they obeyed the gospel, it made them virtually second-class citizens in the kingdom of heaven. And there came the first big fight in the church, even though the New Testament was being revealed. So you had the Judaizing teacher. He says, yes, you Gentiles can be saved by Jesus Christ through the gospel. But not only must you hear the gospel, believe in Christ on the basis of it, repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be baptized for the remission of sin, but you men must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. And that bound no men what God in the gospel did not bind on them. And God does not wink at men who legislate for him. Whether they're loosing by their legislation men from what God and his word has bound on them, or whether they're binding on men what his word does not bind. In the Lord's church, we are all offered the same hope of salvation. What color is your spirit? What will your resurrected body look like? You know, John does dwell on that. We talked about this last time around. John just simply says, we'll be like Christ in the glorified resurrected body, but we shall see him as he is. That's all he says. Genetics gave us the bodies we've got, the color of our hair, and eye, and the stature, and all those things. We learned that as Paul talked to the Galatians, we had a big problem with Judaizing teachers. We're departing from the faith. In the first chapter, he says there's only one gospel. It's the one I preach to you. And the uh, person's a curse who preaches any other gospel the one I preach to you. He says then, in reiterating what they did in becoming Christians, after he says they were baptized into Christ, he says in the church there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, that's slave or free person. There's neither male nor female, spiritually speaking. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Now listen, there's never going to be unity among people based upon human doctrines. There will be unity that God wants among people through <coughs> the gospel of Christ. I said, most people won't pay attention to the gospel of Christ. What does that tell you about unity ever being what it ought to be in this world? It never will be. But as a Christian who's dedicated to Christ, to follow his authority in the New Testament, we must live righteous lives in the midst of all of this. And we cannot allow our emotions, our personal likes and dislikes, whatever it may be, to pull us away from the doctrine of Christ. There was the promise of the new covenant, and the scripture says people from every nation, that's every ethnic group, would flow into the kingdom of Christ. That was back in the Old Testament. It's one of Daniel's prophecies. Daniel 7 and verse 14. It says, When Christ, speaking of the day of his coronation in heaven, following his resurrection and ascension back to heaven, it says, Then to him was given dominion and glory in the kingdom. He proclaimed that Christ was ruling at the right hand of God at the day the church started in Jerusalem on that first <coughs> Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. And then it says this, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. All of them, Christ. The gospel, I say again, which is God's power to save you from sin, and there is no other, Romans 1, 16, is preached to those, listen, preached to those who dwell on the earth. To every nation, tribe, Tongue and people. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. 
That's the last book of the Bible. There's more inspiration ended in the writing of God's Word. That's what he said. So we sing the message the, the song, the gospel is for how many? The gospel is for all. John's vision of heaven was this. It was one of a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white, that is, every deed, they died faithful, with palm branches in their hands as a way of saying they were worshiping God. Revelation 7 and verse 9. I say again, we in the church must know that the gospel is to be taught to all people. It's the only way people are going to be unified. The Democratic Party is not going to do it. The Republican Party is not going to do it. The United Nations is not going to do it. The gospel is not going to do it. Now, what does that say about unity? There will be a lot of it because people are going to turn away from God. The thing that's growing more in the last years, and you know this, is secularization of materialism in America. There is no God. Christ is not Savior. The Bible is not the Word of God. Now, when men leave that, they have to turn to something else. Well, you have to turn to secularism. There's nothing else left but to turn to man. That's humanism. Man is the measure of all things. That's where we are today. All these people doing a lot of the stuff they're doing, supposedly for a good cause, are really trying to upset, turn upside down all these things that helped us be what we are today. A lot of people, innocent, ignorant, but innocent, jump in on something that looks real good, and yet it's already been taken over by people who have ulterior motives. Why can't we read history and know that's what happened? That's what the communists have always done. That's what the Nazis did. That's what every subversive has done. And that's the reason communists call people like this useful idiots. And that's what they call them. And when they take over, guess who's going to stand for a firing squad or be sent to some gulag somewhere? It's going to be the useful idiots because they've been used and we've got the best to fit out of them and we're going to be by using them. Therefore, we don't need them anymore, and they're gone. And Stalin used to say, man's a problem. Take away the man, the problem is gone. And he killed them on the day. Because if you are a communist, you do not believe in God. And we could go more, and we will later. That's lesson on communism. But we know the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even in the end of the world. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. No one is to be excluded. The truth is to be preached to all. But one nationality or ethnicity to place itself above any other would be sinful. As God is no respecter of people, neither can his people be. Am I answering my question? So rather than seeking to divide, we must seek to fulfill Christ's dream of becoming one. Our Lord prayed that we would all be one, even as he and his Father are one. That the world may believe thou hast sent me. John 17, 20, 21. That oneness is under his authority in the gospel. And that's the only true way that people will be one. However, now we're going to get steep. However, Today, others define racism to be entirely something. I'm going to read you a quote. Anybody can find it. Listen. Everybody listening? Just type into your Google search, Black Lives Matter. Remember, about definition of terms, I can define that, but that is perfectly wholesome, perfectly right. But will you be willing to read what they say of themselves that came out of their own mind and they put it on words and they put on there for you to read so you can really know what they believe? Hitler wrote, Mein Kampf, My Struggle and My Journey. It was there for 20 years before World War II. He told exactly what he was going to do. And people crossed their eyes and wouldn't believe it. And so we had World War II. Russia alone lost 30 million people at least in World War II, just Russia. And by the way, you go over there and World War II still quite a bit alive in those people. 
Let me read to you this. It's under why or what we believe. Black Lives Matter. We're guided by the fact, and I'm quoting, we're guided by the fact that all black lives matter, regardless of actual or perceived sexual identity. Actual or perceived sexual identity. Gender identity. Gender expression. Economic status. Ability. Disability. Religious beliefs or disbeliefs. Immigration status or location. Those are not my words. I didn't invent them. They put it on there for you to read it, for you to know. They're bold. I'm glad they did. At least that's what they really are. That's not the end of it. Listen, I quote again. We make space for transgender brothers and sisters to participate and lead. I wonder what their definition of racism is. I go further. We are self-reflexive and do the work required to dismantle this gender privilege and uplift black trans folk, especially black trans women, who continue to be disproportionately impacted by trans antagonistic violence. Think they're just talking about ethnicity? Going on down, we foster a, this is their words, coming from their mind, explaining what they believe. We foster a, a queer affirming network. That's what they said. Don't believe me, look it up. When we gather, we do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking. That's from what we believe in Black Lives Matter. If you can read and understand your mother tongue and have a dictionary, and you're willing to do so, and you're honest with yourself and with the words they have written that came from their own mind telling you what they are, then this group declares support for homosexuality and other deviations from sex only being allowed in a marriage between a man and a woman qualified by God to marry. Marriage and the bed is undefiled, Hebrews 13, 14. They don't believe that. While such a stand is considered popular in the secular world, Christians, as that term is defined and used in the New Testament, recognize that this runs contrary to the teachings of the Bible and my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. The group also declares itself as opposing traditional marriage with a husband and wife raising children. Let me quote again what they say. Again, from what we believe. We disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and, quote, villages, unquote, that collectively care for one another, especially our children, to the degree that mothers, parents, and children are comfortable. Did you notice something particularly left out there? Fathers. I mean, your father and all. Now, why would they leave fathers out of the statement? Ephesians 6 4 says, Ye fathers, do this and so. Brethren, I, I don't know why people won't believe what people tell you. If I tell you, I'm going to lie to you because I want your money and I'm going to tell you the falsehoods that are going to. Uh, Rookie do you out of your money. And yeah, I just, you know, sort of smile. Like, oh, he can't really mean what he said. That's where we are today. People come out and tell you plainly what they believe, what they're doing. Now, in this most recent episode, it's still going on. You ever wonder why this thing is worldwide? Why is it in Europe? Why is it in America? Go read, and you'll see in this same page on the news, or in the particular page is theirs. They'll tell you they're international. That's why that they're doing what they're doing in London and other places. I just wish we would believe a person when he tells you he's going to shoot you. Before you're laying there in your own blood wondering why he shot you. 
But the point I want to make in closing too is that does not remove us as children of God from making sure that we understand how brothers and sisters in Christ are to be as the New Testament teaches and the love we are to have for one another. And that we cannot let people like this, I don't care what banner they're flying that sounds so good and looks so well, I want them to define their terms. And they did. And if they lied or told you exactly what they're going to do. And by their fruit you shall know them, and I know what they're doing. But we must live godly lives. And we can't get ourselves embroiled in those things. Because it sounds good, because it looks good. We must love one another as Christ loved us. We must love his brethren. We must do unto others as we have him do unto us. We must learn the lesson of who is my neighbor and how to help people. And we must not get ourselves entangled, as Paul told Timothy, in the affairs of this present world. It may take a lot of thinking and you get rid of knee-jerk reactions and put some emotions behind you. But after all, that's part of being a faithful Christian anyway, is to bring every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ, as Paul said. But these things need to be understood. We must know, and I'll close here, be not, not envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them, for their heart studies destruction and their lips talk of mischief, Proverbs 24, 1 and 2. In closing, Paul to a young preacher, Timothy, and think of the society and culture of the nation they had in the Roman Empire. Paul says this, know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come, and I'm not speaking of end time. I'm talking about the last days of the Christian age, however long it will go. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Now you'll see the real reason people are what they are. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incompetent, Fierce despisers of those that are good. Traitors, petty, high minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power of thereof, that is I end it. From such turn away. 2 Timothy 3 1 through 5. Well, he meant what he said then, and he said what he meant, and he still does. Fairness, equality, are ideals that Christians promote. Or you can't promote the New Testament and preach the gospel. And when you contend for the faith, you're contending for those things that are presented in the New Testament. But the group I mentioned here claims to want these goals by going about it in ways that actually destroy the foundation of society. And that is their goal. How do you know that? I read and understand my mother tongue. And that's what they wrote in, my mother tongue. And they told me the thoughts of their heart and their plans. And you can go over and read that. I won't do it now as I close. But they also have a little side note over the side. It says, we need your help in reporting to us all those who do not agree with our statements. I close this lesson. This is going on YouTube. You might better put your best up. That is the bulletproof thing. Whatever the case, I'm not going to be quiet. Not in this time with things happening to undermine the very foundation of our constitutional republic that guarantees us the right to be just exactly what I'm doing right now. And the freedom of assembly which we're doing. Let them report these things. So what? I read them a long time ago, died for the cause of Christ. And Christians were called atheists in those days because they didn't believe in the pagan God. Well, I believe we ought to be wise. And we'll be wise as servants, harvest as doves. So let us be sure that we measure things and think through and know our Bible and in the light of it judge all things. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation to become a Christian, we've gone through the kind of salvation. As a child of God, if you sin, we urge you to repent, confess those sins, and pray God for forgiveness. Whatever you do, stand strong in the Lord. Be thou faithful unto death. I will give thee the crown of life, Revelation 3.
If you're subject to the gospel call, we invite you to come look at